Howdy. Feel good? Yes, I do. I do. Um, welcome. Welcome to 11 o'clock. As Matt has already said, most of you need to find another service to attend. So uh, nine, <laughs> nine and one. Uh, we've got some space, less space in the nine, but feel free, to, feel free to come with the one for a lot of you college students who love to sleep in. That's your prime time. Enjoy. So truly, last, last service, which, which is at the nine again, I want to remind you who are here. Uh, at the last service, I did not know how I wanted to start the, the sermon. I didn't know how I wanted to jump in. And so I gave them a little choose your own destination <laughs> intro. And this is not a joke at all. I walked up on stage and I was still like, I don't know. I'll let the people decide. And so it was either that or flip a coin and no one carries cash or coins anymore. So this was a much easier approach. So here's your option. I'm going to present the same to you and I'm happy to do either. We are in John chapter 19. So option one, we're talking about the death of Jesus. We just jump straight into it. Or option two, I tell you about my family's recent obsession with YouTube. I can do either, and I'm seriously, legitimately, all joking aside, happy to do either. Who would prefer uh, we start with YouTube? Okay, all right. Who would prefer we just dive into it and go from there? Okay, unfortunately, YouTube has... Well, I, I can't do both, unfortunately, because one is jump straight into it, Talia, which would defeat the purpose of doing the both. So, okay, so YouTubers have it. So I'll make this quick. Right now, my family has a weird obsession with YouTube. We don't have cable, and so I guess this is what non-cable people do. But I was really opposed to YouTube for a long time for my kids. I have three girls, and uh, Deshae is not as much into YouTube. She likes watching, like, 90 sitcoms. I think she's currently watching The O.C., but... I, I, I've developed this passion with my kids for YouTube and I told them I didn't want them to watch YouTube because it's this endless source of just stuff and it plays another video and another video. And I mean, I know a lot of you are like, well, that's TikTok, but I, I don't, I'm not, I'm too old to get that reference. And so I just, I enjoy YouTube still. And so we have been watching a lot of YouTube and we like to watch Mark Rober in our house. I don't know if any Mark Rober fans are out there, but he's fantastic. We've enjoyed watching How Ridiculous. I just introduced them to Dude Perfect. But the, the one that we just binge, and I mean, my oldest daughter, Everly, she'll wait till everybody else goes to sleep. She will sneak down. She's very, very sneaky. She will sneak down, and she will try to convince me to watch an episode while everybody is asleep. And it is a channel called Mr. Beast. And um, anybody seen Mr. Beast? Is there a couple? Nobody? Wow, you are alone in the world. So uh, he, the, he's one of the most followed, subscribed to uh, content creators. And uh, Mr. Beast is really, really fascinating. He, he has figured out this like perfect YouTube algorithm to get people to click, but then also get them to stay through the entire video. And he does this by giving away just stupid amounts of money and things. And it seems like every 10 seconds in his video, he's giving away like $1,000, $10,000, a Tesla, a Lamborghini, $500,000, like an island he gave away, a million dollars he gave away. He just does this insane, crazy stuff. And, and no lie, like he'll put, he'll put $40,000 and he'll be like, all right, you can either, it gives a, a person an option. This is a seven seconds of his 14 minute video. He'll be like, you can... Press this button and share it with a random stranger who you'll never meet. You can share this $40,000 or you can press this button and just steal it all for yourself. I mean, that decision lasts this long. They press the steal button. He's like, great, you won $40,000, next clip. And they just like move on to something else. And I've racked my brain to see why it's so addicting. And listen, I don't know him. I don't know his world. You like, listen, this is not an endorsement of Mr. Beast. I don't know anything about Jimmy's world. I please don't send me an email about like how he supports this thing or that thing, or he made a video years ago. I don't know anything about that. I just know that I want to watch another video because it's super fascinating to see that level of generosity. There's something about watching someone. He has a video where he just goes around to random homeless people and hands them like thousands of bucks. It's, it's, it's crazy. And there's something about that kind of extreme generosity that captures human attention, doesn't it? I mean, who in the room doesn't like to watch crazy extreme stuff? From some of you older people in the room, you remember a guy by the name of Ty Pennington who used to be on Extreme Home Makeover, and they'd be like, move that bus. And the bus goes out, and there's a brand new house awaiting a family. And you just were like, you're emotional. And it's like, I don't, you, you know, you're pretending like you're not emotional. You're like, it's sinuses. And you see, it just there's something so amazing about watching extreme generosity, isn't it? There's something moving about that. But 
much more so about sacrificial generosity where you know it really cost the individual. Time or energy or money, whatever it is, there's something so captivating about sacrificial generosity. And today as we dive in to John chapter 19, what we are going to be seeing is the most sacrificially generous act that the world has ever and will ever know. There is nothing that will compete with the level of extreme and sacrificial generosity that we will see on full display than when Jesus gives his life, the cosmic creator of the world offers his life in exchange for ours. It's absolutely insane. And so if you're joining us for the very first time, we've been in this letter from a dear friend of Jesus's and his name is John. And what John is giving us is an eyewitness account. He saw these things take place and he's just recording it so that we might know who Jesus is and believe. And he's telling us about the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the spoiler alert, the resurrection of Jesus, which we'll get to soon. And so Here's where we jump in, John chapter 19. If you want to join me, great. Verse 23, we're going to read about the death of Jesus. Sounds very exciting, right? Everybody's like, oh, that was fun with the YouTube, heavy with the death. So let's jump in. John chapter 19, here we go, verse 23. When soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. And so they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things by standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, so many Marys. When Jesus saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved, that's John, the guy who's giving us this eyewitness account and writing it for us. When he saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. There's a handoff. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on the hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is what? Finished. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath is a high day or a holy day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so that they might be taken away. (coughs) Excuse me. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came blood and water. He who saw it bore witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may what? Believe. Believe. John is not leaving it up to mystery why he's writing these things so that you might believe. For these things took place that the scripture may be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So this is our text today. And you're saying to yourself, self, how in the world are we going to get through all of that? We aren't. We're going to focus on one phrase, which I'll get to in just a second. So Matt preached a message last week that was all about the cross. You should go check it out. Another weird endorsement for YouTube, but you can, you can check that out there. Go enjoy it. It was a fantastic message that really went over what the cross looked like, what his journey to the cross looked like, and specifically the torment and shame that he endured on our behalf. And I think I can sum up Matt's message with this. Death by crucifixion is gross. Would we agree? I mean, if you, if you heard it last, death by crucifixion is gross. There's a lot of blood, a lot of gore. It's very, very icky. Yet, we sing songs about it almost every single week here. I need you to understand, if you are used to church world, this is your world, I need you to understand how weird that is. We sing about and rejoice about the blood and the cross. Like, 
I'm hearing something. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. I thought somebody was like talking back to me. I didn't want to miss it. Okay, so listen, we sing about the cross on a regular basis. He, hear how insane that is. The cross used to be this symbol of utter humiliation, torment, death, and shame. It was capital punishment. And then just moments ago, we sang a song called Son of Suffering, where we're like, your cross is my freedom. And like a lot of us, hands are up and we're smiling. It's a weird thing that has happened where we've taken the cross from this source of suffering and shame, this horrendously gross act to what it is now. But in God's upside down kingdom, he brings new meaning to the cross entirely. And I want you to think about this. The early followers of Jesus, they had to pick kind of a mascot for their new movement. They had to pick a symbol that represented their new movement. They could have chosen a rainbow for God's promise to not flood the earth. They could have chosen like a happy sun. They could have chosen lots of things. These early followers, just years after Jesus' death, what do they choose? They choose a cross. That's wild. And for us, it may not feel wild because the cross is just kind of pop culture at this point. Like my first tattoo was a cross. Like you see hip hop artists with gigantic crosses. Madonna, even a few years back on her tour, she crawled up on a cross at the end of the tour every single night. It's a we- like The cross has just become this sort of diluted, ho-hum thing. It doesn't really hold the same like weight for us anymore. But it, but it would be like us choosing, like we would say, hey, you know what? Netcast needs a logo, a new logo. All in favor of a lethal injection needle, raise your hand. Right? And that, that doesn't even carry with it the humiliation and, and torture and shame. It just carries the death part. But that'd be weird, right? But like we all voted on it like, yeah, injection needle, let's do it. It's so, it's, it's so odd and so strange. But why did they do that? These early followers of Jesus, they chose the cross because it represented something for them that was so impactful so real, so life-changing, so powerful that they were like, we can't choose anything else. It's the cross. It's all about the cross. And I wonder today as we sit in this room, I don't know where you're from. I don't know what your religious history is, but I have a question for you. What does the cross mean to you right now? What does the cross mean to you right now? Like, just, just think about it for a second. What comes up to your mind? What comes up? Like, what does the cross mean to you? And I'm afraid for some of us who have been around church for a while, some of us have gotten so used to it. We've gotten so used to hearing about it, seeing it, singing about it, that it's sort of lost some of the awe and wonder that it should carry. It's sort of lost the impact that a lot of these early followers felt and saw. And so for us, what I hope to do today is we're going to look at this whole thing about Jesus and specifically what makes him unique among other people that died on a cross. And I'd love to restore a little sense of that awe and wonder that the cross should carry for us. For those of us who trust in Jesus, I want to kind of get us back to a place where this isn't just something we're sort of used to, but it's something that brings us to our knees in amazement every single time we hear about it. And if you've never heard about it, I hope to give you a really accurate depiction of what it means for this guy, Jesus, to die on a cross for you. And so here's what I need us to understand. Dying on a cross doesn't make Jesus unique. You know that, right? Do you know how to catch a unique rabbit? Unique up on it. I did that for <laughs> Matt. It's one of my, go- that's one of my go-tos. You're welcome. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. There's more. Um, But like dying on a cross didn't make Jesus unique. Thousands of other men died on a cross. A few women did, but it was mostly reserved for men. Thousands of other people died on a cross, but no one's gathering every week to sing songs to them. No one's gathering every week to go over their teachings, right? Can can you, no one's, no one's praying to these people. There's something different about Jesus. No one's proclaiming these other crucified people No one's proclaiming their messages to the world, but Jesus is different. And Jesus sums up how he's different in this one phrase. When on the cross, he said, it is what? Finished. 
When he said, it is finished, that's a really unique statement to make while being crucified on a cross, right? And maybe you've heard it so much it doesn't ring that way, but can you just imagine the people standing around watching him give his life? And he says right before he bows his head and dies, he verbalizes, it is finished. This phrase and the meaning of this phrase is what separates him from everyone else. We don't follow Jesus because he was crucified. We follow him because he isn't just a man. He is God who came and completed something on that cross that no one before him and no one after him will accomplish. So if dying on the cross isn't what makes Jesus special, then what is it? What did he do that others didn't and others couldn't. And that's the two main things I wanna focus on today. Number one, I wanna look at when Jesus says it is finished, what exactly he did accomplish on the cross, all right? So we're gonna focus most of our time on what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And then at the very back end, we have to address the question of why did he do it, right? It's not enough to just focus on what he did. We have to focus on why he did it. So if you're with me, say yes. Yes. Great. All right, so we're gonna jump into the four things Jesus accomplished on the cross. He accomplished so much on the cross, we could spend every single week talking about it, and we do, but I'm gonna focus mainly on the four primary things, uh, and you can take notes that'll help my self-confidence, okay? So number one, number one thing he accomplished is Jesus became our atonement. Jesus is our atonement, which means he died in our place. 1 Peter 3.18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He became our atonement. Now, the theological term for this, for you nerds in the room, is perfect penal substitutionary atonement. And I know that Matt loves that I just used the word penal, but perfect (laughs) penal substitutionary atonement, you're welcome. Perfect means what you think it means. Penal means penalty for, substitutionary just means in place of or substitute, and atonement means offering. It means that we owed something we couldn't pay. We owed a debt that we couldn't pay, and Jesus became our payment. He was our perfect penal substitutionary atonement. Now, I know that some of you in this room might be saying to yourself, self, that's intense. He paid for what? Like, I didn't ask him to do that. Do you understand? Like, I haven't done anything worth that. I I, I didn't ask anybody to die for me. I didn't ask anybody to get up on a cross. There's no need for that. There's no need for someone to do that in my place. But the Bible tells us differently. In Romans chapter three, which is a letter in the Bible, we hear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. And you don't even have to fully know what sin is to know that you did it. Right, you know, you walk around with a sense of like, we're not perfect. You feel that, right? I feel that. We know we're not perfect. We can't even keep up with our own standards, much less the standards of a perfect God. We all have sinned. And then later in that same letter of Romans in chapter six, it says for the wages of sin or the penalty of that sin is death. Because of sin, death was coming to collect a debt from us and Jesus stepped in. The most insane thing to me that happened on the cross wasn't just the way Jesus died. It wasn't just the humiliation that he experienced in the torture. It was that in a moment on the cross, all the wrath that God has toward sin that would be forgiven was poured out on Jesus. Every hell that ever would be experienced For those of us who trust in Jesus, he pours out on Jesus. And Jesus in that moment is separated from God because he was in our place. He took on all the sin that would be forgiven. Can you imagine? Can you imagine bearing all of just your sin at one time? All the shame you've ever felt, all the guilt you've ever felt, all the pain you've ever caused all the sin that's ever been done to you, can you imagine just bearing your sin, much less the sin of all time that would ever be forgiven? That is what Jesus experiences on the cross. But Jesus didn't step in for us just because we were his homeboy. He didn't just step in for us because we were besties for the resties. 
Jesus stepped in while we were enemies of God. This is the insane reality. Romans 5 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from, his, from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And I get it. Some of us, we don't feel like enemies of God. We just feel indifferent, right? I mean, did many of you feel like enemies? No, I mean, can you even imagine before, before, for those of you here who have trusted Jesus and you're like, man, I believe in that. Often we don't feel like an enemy of God on the front end. We just feel indifferent. But the Bible says that sin doesn't make us indifferent. Sin makes us an enemy. And God sacrificed his son for us so that we would no longer be enemies, but be loved ones and be considered sons and daughters. That's wild, right? <clears throat> now, I wonder how many of us would have done the same. I want, like, let me ask you this question. What if you could sacrifice the person in your life that you love the most for your enemy? Would you do it? I mean, you shouldn't have to think about it long. I'm being, I'm being serious. Like, if someone came to you and said, the person you love the most, if you will give up their life, it can save your enemy. Would you do it? No, there's not a single one of us in this room that would do that. Like if you came to me and said that I could give up my wife or one of my three girls in exchange for my enemy, I would laugh hysterically. And you're like, well, that person's gonna die. Well, good riddance. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Thank you so much. Like I, I, I wouldn't even give up my wife or one of my daughters in exchange for you. And I like you fine. Do you know what I'm saying? But God, in his, this is the good news, that God in his insane, infinite wisdom gave up his son, his very life. He gave it up in exchange for his enemies. And some of us, we've heard this good news, right? If you've been around church a long time, you've heard this good news so much that it sort of just flies over your head at this point. Some of us are in a place, be real with yourself, where even as I am talking about the cross now, you're like, that's really interesting information. That's neat that he did that. We've lost the awe and the wonder that it deserves. This good news should really only cause one of two reactions. Unfortunately, it kind of causes a third, which we'll talk about in a second. But this good news should accomplish one of two things. It should either make us rejoice in God or reject him entirely. Either rejoice in God or reject him entirely. The Bible tells us that the message of the cross is foolishness for those who don't believe it. We get it. If you're in this room and you don't believe this, part of this seems like a fairy tale to you. Like, I get it. It sounds pretty wild because it is but it doesn't mean that it's not true. But for those of us who do believe it, the Bible tells us that it is the power of God himself for those of us who believe this good news. And I wonder for us, where do we find ourselves on that scale? Like right here, right now, as we talk about the cross and Jesus and his sacrifice, does it ignite you? Does it ignite your heart? Does it cause a sense of awe and wonder and and just absolute praise almost? You wanna just bust out with excitement for what Jesus has done? Or if we're honest, is this kind of like, meh, that's like old news, not fake news, old news. Because I think in a lot of churches across America, we're filled with a bunch of mad people. That's like just, then the cross is just sort of like, a thing that's cool and neat. And I don't mind that it's like, like a logo of like our thing, you know, but it's just, it's kind of whatever. And I wonder if that's us today. But for you meh people, I would warn you, people who attempt to live in this neutral, apathetic, sort of like meh space with God, the Bible says it doesn't go super well. In Revelation, Jesus is speaking and he says, because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold, I will what? 
I will spit you or spew you out of my mouth. That's gross. And that's not a threat. That's a promise. When Jesus said, it is finished, he became our atonement. We either rejoice in it or we reject it. But riding the fence about it is going to get us hurled in a way that I don't think we're going to like very much. It is finished. Jesus is our atonement. This is the good news. All right. Second, Jesus is our victor. He died to crush our enemies. Jesus is our victor. Colossians 2 And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. I love how how clear the Bible is. Were we like sort of wounded and crawling to help? No, we were dead. You jump off a 400-story building, you're not going to ask someone to call 911. You were dead in your trespasses, right? And God made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demands. Then he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What is Paul making reference to here, the writer of Colossians? What was nailed to the cross, physically speaking? Jesus was. And Paul says, no, 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 no. He he didn't just get nailed there in a physical sense. He was accomplishing something so much greater. He's giving it all new meaning. Paul says he nailed our trespasses to the cross. He nailed all that record of our debt to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame. That's the insanity of the cross. As Matt preached about last week, they thought they were putting Jesus to shame, right? They thought they were mocking him by writing King of the Jews. They thought they were making fun of him and spitting on him and putting him down. But the writer of Colossians here says, oh, nay. They dis, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus is our victor. He has no rival. It's not Jesus versus anyone. It's not good versus evil. It's not, you know, Jedi, like good versus Jedi, bad. It's just Jesus. He stands alone as the winner of all time, the greatest reigning MVP of eternity, the GOAT. It is Jesus. There is no one else. He has no rival. He has no equal. He has won. It is finished. But for us, I wonder what it would change in our life, in our daily life, if we actually started living like that was true. I wonder what it would change in our daily life if we started living from a place of victory rather than pretending like we have to earn it on our own. I wonder what it would change for us in our daily life to to truly live from a place of victory rather than fight for a place of victory. And if it's hard for you to kind of fathom and think about, let's think about it through the the lens of some of our favorite movie characters. Okay, let's let's all have like a little exercise here. And I've picked some old movies. So if you haven't seen these yet, that's really on you. (laughs) All right, so spoiler alert, whatever I need to say in advance, you know, plug your ears. But here's what I want to look at. I want to think how different classic movies would have been if the end was never in doubt for the characters. How different classic movies would have been if the heroes of our story were never in doubt. The heroes and characters we all know and love, they know what the end is. Can you imagine how much more joy and confidence they would have as they move about their story? Can you imagine how much more boldness they would have If they knew the end wasn't in doubt, our favorite heroes, it would save those characters so much pain, so much strife, so much heartache, and so much anxiety, right? Let's take Star Wars. Let's take Star Wars. For those of you who haven't seen Star Wars, again, I think you haven't seen Star Wars, have you? That's sad. Okay, well then either plug your ears or get with the program. So Star Wars, let's imagine we find young Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. We take one of Elon Musk's rockets and we go to Tatooine, wherever that is, and we find young Luke and we say, listen, it's very simple. He's your dad. That doesn't mean a lot to you now, but it will. Also, you're going to be fine. Things might get a little weird for a moment, but you're going to be completely fine. You're going to meet some people that you'll care about. Their names are Han and Leia. They will also 
be fine. There's a guy named Yoda. He's going to weird you out at first for sure, but he's amazing. You're going to love him. And also don't kiss Leia. We'll leave that one a mystery. (laughs) Can you imagine the difference? Can you imagine? You're like, Luke, like the writer of your story said you're the greatest Jedi to ever live. It's not disputed who the top 10 Jedis are. (laughs) It's just you. So like, you're going to be fine. Can you imagine the level of confidence he walks through the rest of that story? Like he pulls up in his little spaceship. Sorry, those of you, I can't remember if it's a TIE fighter or an X-wing. It's kind of all the same. I know some of you Star Wars people, it's hurtful. I know it's hurtful. But like he shows up in his little spaceship. He's got nothing to fear. He's like, I got it, guys. Everybody can stay home. I'm going to live. He walks in and fights people with his little lightsaber while he drinks like a cosmic cola and just keeps on moving. He has so much confidence if the end is never in doubt. Can you imagine the amount of anxiety and pain that it removes from his daily life? Can you imagine the fresh perspective it gives to him on every relationship and circumstance? Like the guy still gets his glorious ending. He just doesn't have to strive for it. He can enjoy it. Can you imagine Lord of the Rings? We go to like Frodo in the Shire and it's like, hey buddy, wash your feet, number one. Number two, you're gonna be given a pretty big task, man. You're gonna make it. Don't trust the guy who coughs a lot. Also, don't trust humans in general, but the Aragorn guy is fine. You're gonna meet a really big Balrog thing. It's gonna creep you out, but you're not gonna die. No worries, man. Like, can you imagine the confidence when he meets these creepy wraiths and he's just like eating food, laughing it off. He encounters a dragon. He's like, oh my gosh, right? This is where, you know, Gandalf the Gray turns into Gandalf the White. I mean, it's just... It's a totally different world when you know the ending is not in doubt. When you know the victory is already sealed or won. Jesus said, it is finished. We can be confident in how it's all going to end. We may not know every detail of the story, but the last chapter is already written and the end is not in doubt. So we can go through life with a genuine, not faked, sense of joy and boldness and perspective and swagger that comes out of that. There's a certain level of peace that comes from knowing the victory's already won. You don't have to do anything for it. You know you didn't earn it. Someone else earned it on your behalf, but they're gifting it to you in joy. And so for us, we need to stop fighting for victory in our life and start fighting, start fighting from a place of victory that was already won on our behalf. Jesus is our victor. It is finished. Third, Jesus is our redemption. He died for our freedom. Romans 5, 6, and 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus delivered us. We see this picture in the Old Testament. It's kind of a foreshadowing where God sends Moses to save his people from Egypt. Does anybody remember that story? You've seen Prince of Egypt, maybe the Ten Commandments, where Moses goes and says, let my people go. And it's this whole thing. There's a bunch of plagues and ultimately some death. And so then they deliver the people and God reestablishes the people elsewhere. This is what Jesus does for us. He comes and finds us. We don't get to go find him. He comes and finds us in our sin and in our pain and our being enslaved by sin. And he says, listen, I'm going to get you guys out of here and pay the price for it. While we were still sinners enslaved, he came and died for us. And the insane reality is he was happy to do it. He thought we were worth saving. And, And here's an interesting question. How do we say what the value of something is? How do you know what the value of something is? Well, somebody's willing to pay for it, right? When you, go, when you want to find out, I'm going through a thing right now where I'm cleaning out a bunch of stuff in my basement that I'm trying to sell. And when you want to find out what it's worth, you go to eBay, but you can't just check the listings, right? You got to go to completed or sold to not just see what it's listed for, but what somebody's actually willing to pay for that item. That's how much it's worth. The way we measure value is by the price someone is willing to pay. And, and, and I know this isn't going to surprise anybody, but Jesus paid a pretty high price right? He literally gave his life for us. What does that say about how he views you? What does that say about the value that he places on your life? 
in a world that's constantly trying to rip our value to shreds or trying to tell us that we have to earn the right to be considered valuable. God has already declared each one of us infinitely valuable by creating us in his image and then giving his life to show what we are worth. And I wonder what it would change for us if we viewed ourselves with the same value that God does. What if we saw ourselves as, as valuable as God sees us? I wonder how, how differently we would treat our body. I wonder how differently we would view sex. I wonder how differently we would handle criticism when we didn't think that our work or our stuff was, was our value, but we knew that we were infinitely valuable because of what someone already paid for us. How differently would we view our job if we saw ourselves with the same level of love and acceptance that Jesus gave to us? We are free. We are valuable and we are free. Jesus has done everything for us to feel that value and walk in freedom. But too many of us are busy being lazy, depressed, anxious, or legalistic. Like we get to live a free life. The point of Jesus' sacrifice wasn't so that we would just walk around life and be all sad about it all the time that somebody gave their life for us, but that we would accept the victory that was won in our place, see that he has saved us from all of the ramifications of our sin and death, and that we get to then go and live a full life that's full of joy and peace and excitement. Like this life is meant to be lived wide open, full throttle. But so many of us, we walk around so hesitant because we live as though we are not free. Jesus is our redemption. It is finished. We've been set free. We just need to live like it. Fourth thing, Jesus is our justification. He died for our righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Now, righteousness is not a word you use every day at work. Righteousness literally means right standing with God. We are in the right standing with God. And listen, you and I know, we have no business being in right standing with God, right? You know you need help for that. You can't keep up with your own standard. I can't keep up with my own standard. We certainly know that we need outside help to be made right. If there is a perfect God who is out there somewhere, we need that. That's what Jesus came to do. We're called righteous because of Jesus. And the word we use is justified or the fancy word is justification. And when this word was taught to me, this is how it was taught to me. They're like, you know, you've been justified, which again is not a word that you use every week at work. And they would say justified is just as if I had never sinned. You see what they did? It's like a very pastoral play on words. We like to be really nerdy. So they'd say justified is just as if I'd never sinned. But that's not what it means at all. To be justified means you absolutely did sin. And then God sent his son Jesus as a sacrifice and an atonement for your life to put you into right standing. We call this the great exchange or double imputation. We hand God our sin. He hands us his righteousness. Can you think of what a gross exchange that is for God? Think of how nasty that is. All of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt, all of the hurt that you've ever caused or has been caused to you, you hand it, probably stinks and it's dripping. That's how I view it. It's just, it's moist. It's just nasty. We hand it over and then he hands us his right standing. He hands us his righteousness so that God sees us as he sees us. Jesus, it's absolutely insane. Being justified is like this. Imagine you're in a courtroom. Imagine you're the one on trial. Put yourself in that courtroom. The accusations get brought up against you and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are guilty. You know you're guilty. There's tons of eyewitnesses that know you're guilty and you just have to sit there and take it like a champ. And then when all is said and done, the judge that's presiding over the case looks you square in the eye and says what you know is coming, guilty. Then what do you have to do? You have to await what? Sentencing. So you come back for your sentencing, you come into that space, you know you're guilty, and the the sentence is handed down that you are to be executed for what you did. The cost of your crimes is death. 
That sentence gets handed over to you. The judge slams the gavel and at that same exact moment stands up and says, okay, you're guilty. The penalty is death, but I'm going to take this one for you. You deserve to die, but instead, I will happily accept your death. As of right now, judge's decree, you're free. See you later. You don't even have to stand here and watch me die. You can go free, go out those doors, and I'll take it for you. Can you imagine the sense of relief? Can you imagine the joy that you would feel? Like th this is what it is to be justified. Jesus is our justification. He finished all this. The verdict is out on you. You for sure are guilty, but someone stepped into your place so that you could walk out that door, an innocent man or an innocent woman. The good news is that you are fully known and fully loved. Don't act like you're hiding anything from God. He knows every motive, every thought, everything you've ever done. You are messed up and guilty and Jesus knows it and he gives you his righteousness anyway. It doesn't matter if you're strung out on drugs, addicted to porn, a raging alcoholic, a murderer, a racist, a prostitute, a cheater, a liar, an adulterer, a self-righteous jerk, a narcissist, a hypocrite, suicidal, or you think you're clean as a freaking whistle, but if we hooked up a video camera to your thoughts and motives, we would all know different. This good news is for you. Amen. Wherever you're coming from, whatever you've done, the good news of the cross is for you. When Jesus says it is finished, he isn't speaking just as a man. He's speaking as a God. He was the only one equipped to actually finish all of this so we don't have to. But the question we have to wrestle with at the very end is then, why did he do it? He didn't need to do that. Don't get it twisted. God wasn't sitting up in heaven going, I, you know what? I need to act here. He could have simply said, sin is your problem. I created it all. I set the standard. You messed it up. That junk's on you. But he doesn't do that. He steps in and he acts. So why did he do it? And the answer may surprise you. In Ezekiel 36, this is what God says to his people. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Why did Jesus do it? For his glory and for his great name. God finishes all that he came to accomplish on the cross because of his own glory. We are merely beneficiaries. And do not, don't think that this makes less of you. See that it makes much of God. If we are going to be in his kingdom, if we are going to be the people of God, we must understand that the universe revolves around him. He is the center of it all. Unfortunately, many of us have come to believe the lie of a me-centered gospel, the me-centered good news. The good news isn't about me. The good news is about him. Our salvation is a beautiful means by which he has chosen to put his glory on display. He has chosen to rescue messed up people by the death of his son to show his greatness. God is and always will be primarily about his glory and secondarily about our good. This is the good news. It is finished. Jesus has done everything necessary to make us right with a holy God. And let me be clear, this is a free gift. But Jesus does make reference to what posture we ought to be in when we receive it. We don't get to receive it lightly. Jesus says in Matthew 16, then he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The call of Jesus isn't to come and consume, but to come and die. 
We are to come and to die to seeking our own glory so that we might live to seek his glory. The king's command is that we come and lay down our kingdom for his kingdom. The work of the cross, these things, that it is finished. The cross refuses to be just another thing in our me-centric universe. The cross refuses to be another symbol that kind of goes with all the other things that orbit around us. When Jesus said it is finished, he accomplished everything for all time that would be necessary for the forgiveness of sin. There is nothing you can add to it. There is nothing you can take away from it. No sin you can commit is too great and no sin is too small because he died for it the same. The truth is just that we're not the main character in the story that God is writing. He is. So what do we do with it? What's our response? The only re- appropriate response to accept this, to receive this good news, is to reorient our entire lives in his direction. To turn from our sin and follow Jesus. To say, I'm trusting his way, whatever he says. I want my wants and my desires to be his wants and his desires. I trust him more than I trust myself, more than I trust all these other things that have let me down and will continue to let me down. I trust in Jesus. We need to stop being motivated by the things that make much of us and start being motivated by the things that make much of God. When we get a raise at work, we don't need to think about the next big purchase or vacation. We can actually think about those in need around us. When we see glorified sexuality on a screen, we need to stop consuming it for our own satisfaction. We need to allow it to break our hearts because those are people made in God's image in need of a savior. When we see a brother or sister struggling with drugs or abuse, we don't classify them as too far gone or turn a blind eye. We dig deep and offer the grace and love of Jesus that he so freely gave to us. When we turn toward God, we stop pretending and start participating. We stop scrolling and start serving. We stop judging and start forgiving. We stop fighting and we start loving. We stop hoarding and we start giving. We stop wishing and we start believing. And we stop acting like we can add a single thing to the work of Jesus on the cross. And we wake up every morning with a renewed sense of passion for the God-given breath in our lungs and the ability to declare his glory just one more day on this earth. The truth and the good news is it is finished. Accept it or don't, those are the options. Let's pray. God, we love you and we can't even fathom. Even as I'm talking about it, I can't fully fathom the weight of what you did. I can't imagine, Lord. I can't imagine what you took from me, much less all those who would be forgiven. Let us see the value that you've placed on us today. pray anybody here who doesn't know you, doesn't trust you, I pray, Lord, that you would like ignite in them a passion for who you are. Lord, we all, for those of us who've trusted you, we know all that other junk lets us down. Most of us have tried it all. It, we know it doesn't cash out, Lord. You are the only thing that's been consistent for us because that consistency isn't born from us. It's not powered through us. It's coming from somewhere else entirely because you have seen us as valuable. You have seen us as worth it. You gave your life while we were still an enemy to you. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We honor you. I pray that you would teach us how to receive that. In Jesus' name, amen.